Let me begin by saying that in some ways this is a slightly odd project for me to have taken on because I'm not an expert in recent US politics and this is really a story about the present, about the world that we're living in right now. The title should tip you off to that in certain ways. But as an intellectual and cultural historian, I've long been invested in a very particular kind of history, which is trying to figure out how the most ubiquitous and commonplace assumptions that undergird democracy, the ones that we rarely even notice because they're so ordinary to our lives and they tend to cross even right-left divides, how did they come into being? And these are the kinds of concepts that we don't tend to talk much about until there's a crisis, until they're in there's a problem. And one of those, I think, is truth and lies. Even now, you hear a lot of platitudes, truth matters, honesty matters, or information or knowledge matters. But there's not been much discussion about how or why. So I found this myself this past year trying to write something that I think is rather novel, which is a short but deep history of democratic truth, of how we got to this moment where everybody is imagines that we're suddenly in crisis. So, are we in crisis? That's what I'm gonna talk about first, and then I'm gonna to get to some other questions. But you've heard all of this before. You've heard all, you know all the signs. We have a president who lies constantly, which is to say, deliberately pushes untruths about him, his own past actions and about others. He also, as does his whole administration actually, routinely convey wrong or inaccurate or unverified information. In other words, he challenges truth in both its moral dimension and in its epistemic dimension, by which I mean there's an ethical category about truth and there's also one about how do we know anything. And not only is he unapologetic about doing so, he deliberately often muddies the waters, making it unclear what exactly we're talking about anyway. And you can think of all the expressions that do this. Things like, I've been hearing, or people are saying, or I don't know, but, or who knows, or fake news, or even, I, recently I read one, I, he said, I try to tell the truth, which is interesting. Um, so they're, they're kind of equivocations that keep us a little bit guessing what do we know, what don't we know? But it's not just the president. This isn't a phenomenon that is you know, sort of about one person and a pathology or something like that. Maybe more seriously, polls and voting patterns show that a large number of Americans just don't care. On the contrary, they seem to have embraced this very particular attitude or approach towards the realm of truth and falsehood. Some people seem to value Trump's seeming authenticity as opposed to accuracy or veracity, which is to say that he tells it like it is, he cuts through the euphemistic PC language of others, which is a certain kind, it's imagined, of truth-telling. Some just see a strategy and want to win at all costs. And maybe most interestingly, and maybe most alarmingly, you can decide, many see all facts as a matter of spin and personal inclination, rejecting the idea that there are any impartial, disinterested sources, methods, or arbiters of truth, or any pure, disinterested information. Fake news has become both a partisan label and an all-purpose description of the world. Everything, in a sense, could be fake news. And if you follow any part of the mainstream media, and by that I mean, you know, what's now sort of major TV networks to the New York Times, you're surely aware that there's a lot of hand-wringing about this situation, in part because it seems like a direct threat to what these media outlets do. Post-truth, which was the word of the year in 2016, I think I just read that this today, that the new word of the year is toxic, which is interesting, but post-truth was the 2016 word, meaning a growing sense that we as a society haven't found any common pre-political starting point, a kind of point of agreement about what the world looks like exterior to us, and we don't think that finding such a starting point is any longer possible. 
And the reason post-truth as a concept got so much attention is that it seemed to many commentators as if it portended a crisis, not just for truth as a category, but for democracy itself. A distinct and ominous turn, in other words, in the history of democracy. That may well be true, though I will also caution at various moments that there's a long history of panics about the decline of truth, as well as a long history of lying in public. We don't have the first or last, probably, uh, lying president. And I'm going to come back to the present. But the premise of my book, Democracy and Truth, A Short History, is that before we can address whether what's happening right now is really unprecedented, and indeed, if democracy is really on the line, we need to stop and ask two other questions that take on a more historical nature. One is, how has the relationship between democracy and truth traditionally been understood or imagined? It's not obvious what these two things have to do with each other, I don't think. And secondly, why has this ostensible perfect marriage between these two exalted concepts so often gone so wrong in politics? And that means backing up in time. And backing up in time a little bit before what pundits usually talk about, which is means backing up before the 2016 election and even backing up before the era of social media. Though, does, anybody, does anybody know what year? I, mean, I, I was shocked when I actually read what year um, you know, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook came on the scene. Anybody remember? Yeah. Yeah, all about the same moment, which makes them a little more than 10 years old. Right, so often the framework for talking about this is, is really the last decade plus a few years. And what you really think what kind of major transformations have happened as a result of that constellation of, you know, basically business developments in the early 2000s. But I think we need to take the story back before then. They'll all eventually get us back to around 2004 or 5 in this moment. So, where to start then? My starting point is that just as democracy has a long history, so does truth. It's understood, looked for, and even celebrated in different ways, in different moments and places. And the first of my questions, how are truth and democracy sort of ideally related, returns us to a very particular and maybe even peculiar truth culture, the truth culture out of which modern democracy emerged. And by that, I mean the Enlightenment. What's essential to recognize for our purposes is that, and if you can indulge me in wildly um, generalizing, the eradication of error and falsehood in pursuit of truth was really the principal preoccupation around which the European and North American Enlightenments revolved. And it was linked from the start to politics in the sense that identifying the key structural sources of all this myth-making and superstition and human error became part of the cause from the start. So what we have to keep in mind to understand the novelty of any of this, why this is an interesting preoccupation in particular to the 18th century, is something about what came before. Early modern monarchical states actually took secrecy and a fair amount of deception to be valuable tools of statecraft. Shielding state information from the eyes and ears of the population, rather than fostering public opinion and encouraging dissent, made good sense to most monarchs for much of history. You can think of Machiavelli, you can think of Frederick the Great. But in the 18th century, something odd happens, which is that past virtue turns to vice, precisely because of this idea that what was wrong with kingship is that it didn't allow any kind of communication between people and the state. And by contrast, according to these new advocates of things called republics that get reimagined, of course these are ancient forms, but they get reimagined in the 18th century by people like Rousseau and Tom Paine. And according to these advocates, republics would be distinguished by the fact that they would turn on an entirely different set of what you might call moral epistemic values. Trust in other people, openness or transparency, truth-telling at every level. 
And I'm describing an ideal here, obviously. We'll come back to the lived part in a moment. But liberty and equality in this new vision would go hand in hand with a commitment to demonstrable evidence and accuracy, as opposed to secrecy, and to a premium on sincerity and candor, rather than a perfectly legitimate previously forms of hypocrisy. And this would sort of be a shift away from monarchical and aristocratic culture. So you get a writer like Louis Sebastian Mercier, who's a kind of devoted follower of Rousseau, imagines the world of the future in the 1770s. And what does he imagine? He imagines the world turning into something like a book, where everything is legible and what we would call transparent. You could see people's motives. All ideas were clear. And the great crime would be lying. Sort of a terrifying world, but it's fascinating reading. It's called 2,440. We're not there yet, but that's what he imagined. And in the US in the last quarter of the 18th century, a legacy of Puritan investment in some similar values, including the alignment of seeing and being, or utterance and action, only bolstered this view. So did early capitalist marketplaces. And in the case of truth and what would come to be called democratic governance eventually, the promise is that one would be an instrument of the other. Pre-existing established truths, including basic factual ones, would serve as a starting point for public deliberation. But then participation in the political process was also, in the end, aid the, in the discovery of truth. Republics would, in other words, make both a secular and a Christian dream of the coincidence of virtue and knowledge, or truth-seeking and truth-telling in both a moral and epistemic sense, a reality. And this is, of course, a kind of ideal that I'm describing. But now we get to the crux of the matter. And partly, I think this is what democratic, makes democratic truth so weird, even though it doesn't seem that weird to us because we live with it every day. But I like things that you know, actually turn out to be rather strange when you look under the hood a little bit. And that has to do with this question of, OK, so truth's going to be important in a republic and then in democracy. But where is it going to come from? How is anybody in this new form of government going to know what's true? And the answer was not obvious then, and it's not obvious now. And I don't think it was even that obvious. There was a lot of working out that had to take place for people like Madison, Jefferson, or European thinkers at the same time. It didn't just, you know, a solution to this problem didn't just fall out of the sky. Because one of the key theoretical characteristics of this idea of modern representative democracy, then known as republicanism, was a commitment to undogmatic, open-ended truth. Again, in contrast to monarchical or religious truth. What does an undogmatic conception of truth mean? First, it means that democratic truth would have, and still has, no precise contours or content. Only logical truths, like two plus two equals four, or my mother's mother is my grandmother, uh, would be sort of fixed assumptions that we would all agree on automatically, set in stone. All the others would be constantly open to challenge, to rethinking, to even potential revision. Moral and religious truths, aside from a few very basic tenets of faith, like telling the truth is better than lying, were understood from the start to be so difficult to find any agreement about that they should largely be sequestered in the private sphere. Now, that's not true of all republics forever, because, for instance, there are republics in Latin America in the 19th century in which Catholicism stays the state religion. But many early experiments at least try sort of removing religious truths from constant public debate, precisely because they were thought to be so disruptive. Well, both humans were thought to be, you know, it was hubris to think that humans weren't infallible, and also they were going to be a subject of conflict. But even more importantly political, factual truths, those kinds of truths that are always contingent because they're about what happened and you need witnesses to verify so you can't just prove with logic, those two wouldn't be set in stone. Those two would be constantly subject to questioning and revision. The idea is that knowledge would continue to evolve as would truth and that had, meant truth had to stay revisable. So that's one thing about this undogmatic truth. But from this core principle, it also follows that no one person or social group could call all the shots. 
no one religious leader, no one political leader. Moreover, no one discipline or method or even institution. Is any student in a, any liberal arts students here? I see some sitting in the room right here. You're all aware that there is no monopoly in how to get to truth through any one discipline in the university. And the same principle guides even government, that you don't hire experts in one field alone. You need a variety of different kinds of ways of getting at truth. Instead, the founders, starting with Jefferson, imagined truth as a result of a social process. Hannah Arendt calls attention to the fact that even this famous line, we hold these truths to be self-evident, doesn't begin, these truths are self-evident. It starts with, we hold, which is to say that some kind of social process is necessary before any truths become self-evident. And this social process was thought from the start to require a kind of division of labor. If you can think of a division of epistemological labor, which sounds pretentious, but what I have in mind is that there'd be two major groups who would help us get to truth in the political sphere. On the one hand, there'd be this mass of ordinary people endowed with wisdom derived primarily from just living their lives, everyday lives, kind of kitchen table knowledge of ordinary people. And on the other hand, you'd have a smaller elite. In the 19th century, they become known as experts, which is a new word from that era, who were the exceptionally educated, credentialed, and trustworthy, which, of course, also meant moneyed, leisured, and well-bred. And the idea went something like this. And again, this is going to sound really familiar, except that it is, again, something that had to be worked out. That ordinary people, as suddenly the new source of sovereignty, would be empowered first to collaborate, to discuss with each other, and finally to decide on a collective, on collective action, or at least those people who would best represent their collective desires. And these ordinary people would do so through a combination of putting together their basic empirical, logical, and normative truths, as well as values and beliefs. Yet it was assumed from the start that ordinary people, even when they were restricted to the property holding, the male and the white, as they long were everywhere, could not know everything necessary to make good decisions about the public good on their own, relying only on their partial, local, everyday knowledge. They required high-quality, broad-ranging information about how things had been, about how they were, maybe about even where things were going, in order to figure out what was best to do going forward. So ordinary people had to turn to some combination of experts and elected officials who were charged with supplying, ideally candidly and transparently, the sort of general factual truths that voters needed to make well-reasoned decisions at the ballot box, and also to filter out what was plain wrong from public discussion. So they were both sort of supplying what you needed to know, but also ideally extracting what was erroneous from conversation. But then this process was going to go on and on. And I don't have to tell you this, that of course, the revision part meant that as soon as some truth was worked out, it was up to a new set of experts to figure out how to enact it, who then themselves would be questioned again with a second set of elections at some point. And this process was considered sort of infinite, right? And it was supposed to result in something like public knowledge or what a little more cynically sometimes gets called today serviceable truths or political truths. Not things we're 100% certain about, but things that are good enough to be the foundations for enough consensus to move forward again. A kind of compromise between science and common sense. And that also meant that the first republics that sprang up at the close of the 18th century, first in North America, then in France, and then in other places, you know, flourishing until this day, a whole set of institutions, norms, practices, even laws were necessary pertaining to speech as kind of props for this picture of truth. So I'll give you a very quick rundown of where they are and then we'll move on from here. One was plain speech. Talking simply, a style of communication that allowed for clarity and sincerity, but also cooperation across class lines, religious lines, ethnic lines. A simple, straightforward language, think Ben Franklin rather than aristocratic discourse, would, it was thought, be an aid to trust in a world in which you had to have confidence in others, but couldn't know everybody at first hand. 
So one thing this world needed was a kind of simple idiom to make it go. Another thing that was thought to need was free speech. An old idea, going all the way back to John Milton, was that competition in information and ideas and texts, in which it was in a world in which it was hard to be certain about much, would ultimately work to dispel errors of different kinds. And by the 18th century, there came the subsidiary idea that errors in politics in particular could be eradicated by allowing free speech as the sort of governing principle, the deregulation of the public sphere as a starting point for imagining this kind of democratic truth politics. And finally, you'd need some specific institutions, too. The press was the first, but other institutions charged with encouraging the development of truth from the research university, a kind of 19th century development, Penn being a critical one in that story, courts of law, political parties, all the way up to you know, the think tanks of the 1970s are given a big role in fostering all of this knowledge. And all of these very particular and modern processes and languages and laws and institutions, along with the different social cohorts to which they're attached, were pressed into service in the hope that they would aid in this very particular idea, which is developing this open-ended, undogmatic, but still vital notion of truth. And if you want to think, is this, am I just describing something with sort of 18th century roots that's disappeared over time? You might think, and here we have to go back to a little before 2005 again, the promise of the internet in the 1990s and early 2000s was often described as the final moment when we could realize some of these ambitions, that truth would become apparent to everyone, that the internet would bring kind of truth and liberation, emancipation everywhere, hand in hand much as printing was imagined initially to do. Okay, so that's kind of the ideal. Now I'm gonna tell you what's wrong with everything I've been telling you up to now. The major problem with what I've been describing is that it was always a set of ambitions, aspirations, whether it was in the hands of the writers of the Federalist Papers trying to get the Constitution passed in the 1780s, or John Dewey in the 1920s, or deliberative democracy theorists today, all of whom use some of the same language and talk about things like common sense and science and their marriage with one another. At issue are not only all the structural problems of what I've been describing, the fact that, for instance, how can you count on the press to ultimately come up with providing the truth as long as it exists in a capitalist marketplace when selling papers, not producing veracity, is the primary charge for most for-profit enterprises? Aside from that, there's the fact that history in practice has transpired really, really differently. Even as democracy ceased to be a pejorative term, so in the 18th, 18th century, nobody wants to be a Democrat. That sounds like a terrible idea. But by the 19th century, democracy everywhere slowly gains currency, as do various what we would call democratic principles, ranging from universal manhood suffrage to compulsory public education. Even so, The very concept of democracy is always more like an aspiration than a real thing. It's always built, for instance, on all kinds of ex glaring exclusions, racial, gendered, ethnic, many of which persist to this day. And you might think, for instance, about all the people who, you know, for instance, don't vote in most countries. Non-citizens or residents don't vote. The young don't vote. Many places, felons don't vote. Oh, that's just one example. And of course, vast inequality of resources, of education, of status remain the norm too. And furthermore, nothing like this really collaborative regime of arriving at truth has ever really come to pass. Instead, truth has become something more like a political football, something that you fight over, much like sovereignty or representation. And if you think about it, often the fights we have about educational questions or about the press or the First Amendment are often really questions about who gets to control the truth, who's, who has power here to determine what is, how ideas are conveyed or learned or disseminated. And especially, I think, and this is really the key part of the story here that I'm going to develop next, is that democratic truth in its modern form in the US and around the world has been threatened since all the way back in the 18th century well before the 
age of the internet, that is, by those eager to hijack it, which is to say, hustle it out of the public sphere and capture the power that comes from having the exclusive right to define it. The threat comes from both sides of the expert people divide. Those who insist upon the validity of elite knowledge in isolation without the corrective of the people's common sense and those who insist upon popular consensus alone without the corrective of expert trained consensus. Because both threaten democracy precisely because they work against any notion of pluralism or conflict leading to consensus. Instead, they pose the problem always of the potential either for total dysfunction, which is one thing that can happen, or of some kind of authoritarianism on the other side. And that can be a kind of populist authoritarianism and attached to the people, or it can be a kind of authoritarianism attached to elites and expert knowledge. It was actually Maximilien Robespierre, ironically, who did so much both to forge modern democracy and to introduce modern notions of police states, who saw the risk from both sides. And this was really early. It's a kind of prescient comment, I think, from the early 1790s. Democracy perishes, he said, by two excesses. The, arist the aristocracy of those who govern, that's kind of separating from the people, or the contempt of the people for the authorities which it has itself established, a contempt in which each faction or individual reaches out for the public power and reduces the people through the resulting chaos to nullity or the power of a single man. Champions of liberal versions of representative democracy have been trying to ward off both tendencies in their extreme form as real and oddly parallel risks ever since. Now, not everyone sees it this way. I'm going to very briefly touch on a few more topics that I think are of interest, but then I don't want to talk for too long because I want there to be some chance for some discussion of these questions. There are those today who continue to extol the superior wisdom and knowledge of the highly educated, especially when contrasted with what is seen as the irrationality and ignorance of ordinary people. And it's an idea that goes all the way back to the founding, where there was lots of discussion and in France as well, about how to ensure that the very best, uh, a natural aristocracy in Jefferson's term, rose to the top as leaders. And today is continued by theorists who call themselves sometimes epistocrats, which is to say uh, those who really believe that though democracy has some nice features, it really is a d distinctly ineffective way to arrive at real knowledge. The, uh, John Dewey, at a certain point, tried to imagine a kind of perfect blending, and many people look back to the progressives as a sort of moment when you could imagine a kind of perfect blending of the democratic and the scientific. But even there, epistocrats will point out, for instance, there are hints of the possibility that sometimes the people don't know best what's in even their own interest, and that sometimes they have to be overridden and by the time you get to Max Weber in the Weimar years, in the early 20th century, he said something I think is rather relevant to us now, which is that even if democracy and bureaucracy grow up together, they're always actually at odds. And in the long run, because they have different social foundations, bureaucrats will always end up in some ways squelching aspects of democracy. And the question remains, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Different people will give you different answers. But I would say that there are certainly dangers here. And this is where, you know, I sort of see dangers on two sides. Dangers in a form of rule that routinely turns its back on the people in favor of elite expert solutions. Cognitive or scientific elites, rather than always knowing best, can, with too much power, become severely compromised as political actors. They can end up presenting us with faulty or partial knowledge. They can dangerously narrow the sphere of debate or decision making by only offering a narrow set of options. And in an extreme, they can render real popular decision making largely obsolete and then ignore the needs of the people 
whom they're supposed to have in mind, essentially removing them from the picture. This is when you end up with what pejoratively in the 20th century comes to be called technocracy, which, or the modern planning state, which is what many people imagine you know, Brussels or Washington being the headquarters of. And when Europeans complain about the democratic deficit of the EU, they don't mean simply that European citizens are not involved in a direct way in making policy, since citizens are rarely involved anywhere these days in making policy. What they mean is that they have so little influence over the nature of those policies and so little means to hold officials accountable that what gets passed as EU law often seems utterly cut off from the kind of lived truths or everyday experience of ordinary people left or right. So on the one hand, I think, and this is where our rent is interesting too, one definite threat all the way through from the 18th century to now has been this kind of expert knowledge, in some sense, overriding democracy. And it's precisely in response to either that happening or the perception that that's happening that we end up with a kind of populist pushback. And this populist pushback, which seems to be having its own global resurgence in the 2010s, much of it in reaction to top-down technocratic government, whether it's Washington or the EU or world organizations of different kinds all based in Geneva, has its own obvious dangers. It doesn't mean that popular rule unto itself is a problem from the perspective of truth. There are serious empirical arguments today sometimes made by people who call themselves epistemic Democrats, these terms are terrible, but the, uh, who, who actually claim that the people do know better. You put a diverse group of people in a room together, you will actually come up with better results than a group of experts. Though it's, it's strange because they're usually experts themselves sitting in universities making this argument, but we'll put that aside. And of course the idea of the knowledge of the ordinary person has been central to every kind of social and emancipatory movement from workers' rights movements to women's rights movements to abolitionism through the centuries. But however, too often evocations of the people in modern life suggest not a pluralistic heterogeneous body, but a unified one, the people, the best people, the pure people, the honest people. And frequent dependence on conspiracy thinking regarding the nefarious ways of elite sources of epistemic authority, since populism is less an ideology than really a kind of narrative about uh, unjust intellectual dispossession, that has its own dangers as well. So does an attachment to the people's supposed instinct and candor over complexity or accuracy. For the result of a populist approach to truth is that it easily deteriorates into a disdain for all forms of established knowledge and its purveyors, as well as dissenting or outlying voices of all kinds, which become, now we're back to the sort of central features of post-truth. I won't take the time now to go through how this too has a very old pedigree that we could go all the way back to the Jacobins and we could go back to the anti-federalists and we could even go back to Edmund Burke to find some of the strains of this notion that the philosophically minded, these sort of people with abstract notions in their heads are pulling the wool over ordinary people's eyes and ignoring quotidian experience. But I will emphasize that just as technocratic solutions are often flawed in major ways, so are populist ones. Populism leads us to simplistic diagnoses of problems. You know, uh, it, it's cold out today, it's snowing, so there can't be global warming, or simplistic solutions. If I want to keep people out of my backyard, I put up a fence, so if I want to keep people out of my nation, I would do the same, a kind of analogic thinking from the kitchen table to the real world. And, maybe more seriously, just as with technocratic solutions, Populism also leads, potentially, to closing down the agonism or pluralism, the sort of conflict and hashing it out between people of different ideas that seem to be central to the ideal with which I started. Now, all of this is to say that there's a long story here. Democracy, to my mind, has been threatened by both of these trajectories, one of them resurgent just when the other is in slight retreat and vice versa for 200 years, and it's not a purely American story either.
But that then gets us to the question, finally, is this time different? Is something else going on now? And it's probably too soon to say, how's that for a cop out? But I would say that much of this traditional story has been exacerbated by new factors in very recent years. And that certainly goes beyond any individual figures. I don't accept the idea, which you sometimes read in the press, that this is all the fault of postmodernism or something like that. I don't think universities have that kind of impact, actually, um, you know, and especially comparative literature departments on the world at large. So that I see as a, something of a red herring. Sort of some structural similarities doesn't really make for affiliation. But I do think we have to pay attention to the rise in the US of new entertainment news formats, including talk radio and 24-hour cable TV, both born of the deregulation of uh, information in the late 20th century, ramped up now, that have in some ways merged with uh, one of the major political parties. Uh, I think that's an important part of the story in the American context. And globally, I think we need to pay attention to the large role the internet, and especially social media platforms, have played in generating the current situation. And here I'm thinking not just of sort of Russian bots and their amplifiers in the context of US elections, but Facebook and, for instance, the Rohingya, the Rohingya in Myanmar situation, which is a case in which all the elements are there from the d dismantling of the boundaries between truth and fiction and uh, the creation of new kinds of tribalisms and solidarities around different kinds of knowledge. We can talk about that. And it's a pattern that is certainly spread. And finally, I think we'd have to think about the economic dislocations of recent years, coupled with the growing awareness, especially among the young, that the nature of many of the problems that we face sort of seems to supersede what any set of experts or ordinary publics organized in national formations can begin to tackle from the displacement of peoples around the globe to the fate of the planet itself. And now that I've left you thoroughly depressed, let me say that I'd be happy in the question and answer period to talk about two other questions in addition to this sort of more historical view. One is, should we have hope? Is there anything that can be done? And Arendt warns us very closely of the dangers of either just simply accepting lies as the common currency of daily life. Her examples are totalitarian. I could say more about that in a moment if you'd like. But also warns us of pursuing truth too vigorously. Because then you end up with something like the terror from the French Revolution where there's fear of any kind of um, hypocrisy, double life, cover up that needs to be exposed. So we get at least the parameters of what's dangerous from a rent without much solution. But we might think about all the different kinds of solutions from the micro, fact checking for instance, to the macro, rethinking whether the free speech principle itself and this notion of a marketplace of ideas has become obsolete in the modern world or whether it's, whether it's ultimately doing more to help or hinder our efforts to arrive at truth. And I do think, actually, that universities are pretty key to all this story in various ways. So it's not a story that's irrelevant to what most of our daily lives entail. And finally, if that's not enough to think about what can you do, you might want, we might want to think about whether it's really true that democracy and truth can't survive without each other. Truth, I think, probably can survive without democracy. It often has. People like Voltaire imagined that a nice enlightened despot would do a lot more to protect truth than any other kind of leadership. And you might think of things like science, for instance, which often do and can do well in situations that can't be called purely democratic. But I would argue that democracy, at least as we imagine it in the modern era, requires at least some commitment to verifiable truth and truth-telling, both from on high and among the population at large. At a practical level, a basic commitment to truth-telling as a moral position is central to maintaining the kind of trust, the basic idea that you mean what you say and I mean what I say and we understand each other. That seems to me essential. That was clear even in the age of revolutions. And so was the necessity of sound information or factual truth. The fact that you can't have a good debate unless you agree on some of the basic factors. We can't decide, for instance, what our economic policies should be unless we have some basic agreement about whether unemployment is rising or falling. 
as a kind of factual point. But even more, I think democracy requires truth as an aspiration. For without this aspiration towards knowing more and conviction that it's possible, there's not that much reason why we'd probably want to live in such an uncertain environment. Because democracy really is premised on an awful lot of uncertainty. This is the undogmatic part of the story. Now, some of you might say, and I've especially heard younger people say this, and I think it's very interesting, that maybe we don't need democracy either. It isn't working very well. And maybe it's just a nice kind of papering over of, other, of not just exclusions, but domination, injustice. And maybe truth is just one more mythology, that it's all kind of a big charade of some kind. But I would say that democracy has one extraordinary virtue, and that's in providing for second chances. And that's, I think, because of its relationship to truth. By this way of thinking, democracy's great advantage is not just a question of the empirical outcomes that it generates, as some theorists would have it, but rather it's because we never can be certain we've gotten it right, and that's okay. And only if we can imagine moral and epistemic progress, that is, progress away from lies and propaganda towards truth, or progress towards some sort of greater balance between our aspirations and our lived reality, can we begin to rectify the problems that face us. In other words, we have to imagine that this revisability being itself a kind of great attribute. On the one hand, I want to leave you convinced just how delicate is the truth construct on which democracy was reconstituted in the Enlightenment and the Age of Revolutions, and just how precarious it has remained ever since. And that's why I'm emphasizing these sort of long-term threats. But on the other hand, I think looking at the present in a historical framework also offers a modest form of hope. It demonstrates that we humans can make collective choices about what happens next. Historians like to call that agency. And in the end, truth, like democracy, isn't something that simply exists in the world, ripe for picking it up or throwing it away. It's rather it's something that we must all continue to consciously and collectively forge. Thank you. A question right away. Terrific. Uh, why do you feel the citizenry is so willing to accept these lies promoted by, the, say, the mainstream media and even the deceptions that are ignored by academia? Uh, I find that just as reprehensible as bold-faced lies. For example, the lies that took us to Vietnam. Um, mm -hmm. If you question that invasion which killed over a million Vietnamese, you were demonized as unpatriotic. And more recently, the invasion of Iraq, which we now know was based on lies. If you question that, you lost your job at New York Times or MSNBC as Phil Donahue and Chris Hedges did. So knowing, and knowing all, the, all these deceits that take us, that are propagated by the media and the mainstream, why do we continue to to succumb to this uh, like sheep uh, without questioning and without having the courage to speak out and dig for the truth, because the truth is out there, not in the mainstream. It may not even be in academia, including Penn, but it's out there. It's a, an interesting question, right? Because you're asking a sort of suspicion of the mainstream media question, but from the left rather than from the right. And it's interesting how that can evolve. I mean, in the, in the era of the Vietnam War, you wouldn't have people on the left sort of saying, but the CIA tells us and the FBI tells us that there's, in other words, suspicion of the mainstream purveyors of information tended to come from the left. And it was conservatives who believed that sort of institutions provided, most of the time, kind of the truth. Interestingly, in our era, that's somewhat reversed. The skepticism about the science provided by universities, about the um, information about the state provided by the CIA, say, has tended to come more, certainly from the far, far left, but more dominantly from the kind of mainstream now of the Republican Party. So there's been a shift, really, in, in, in con conviction about whether mainstream institutions – 
provide us with the truth or not. And what's really hard, I think, to teach especially, is the difference between sort of full-scale paranoia, that everything in the New York Times is faulty, and that it's all a big myth, which is a kind of dangerous, you can't believe anything anyone ever says anywhere notion, and a kind of healthy suspicion that you're talking about, I think, which says, let's look at what assumptions are already built into the things we're told. So when we're told, for instance, this is the unemployment rate, in some ways, we need that as factual information in order to build policy. On the other hand, you might say, even something as plain as the unemployment rate builds into it a lot of presuppositions about what is work, about who should be looking for it, about um, you know, all kinds of assumptions about the world we live in that one could might disagree with to begin with. So the, the, the key is, I think, and this is where universities are important, is to try to model in various ways some balance between this kind of total suspicion, but also a way of reading the New York Times that allows you to think, this might be the closest to sort of mainstream opinion that I can get, but I don't have to take all of it as set in stone in some way. But it's, a, it's an interesting question, what to trust in what eras and why trust erodes on the right or the left in different moments. We're at a moment of, I think, major untrust. And that's what this post-truth moment is really about. The label is for a world in which we can't even agree that there are some places we can all look to find some kind of starting point, what I call political truth. Yeah. Has a, sorry, a time? A time yeah. Okay. You know, the, the truth will out, but the, the truth will out, but the implication is that it may take time. Mm -hmm. Is there, has there ever been um, yeah. advice about dealing with that time, dealing with the patients? When is the risk of it being too late? You know, the information will come out, right. but it will be too late somehow. That's a um, terrific question, yeah, because you're absolutely right. Free speech doctrine has built into it the idea that, sure, a lot of errors and mistaken material and ideas will be thrown up all the time, but if you wait it out, in the long run, truth will rise to the surface. And that's, you can read that in Milton, you can read it in Mill, you can read it in free speech theorists today. And the internet era makes us ask, I think, again, your question about time, right? If enough misinformation circulates in a very small space of time and so fast and to so many people, is it enough to say, well, down the line, we'll know that, you know, um, I don't know, the, you know, Pizzagate, something that, like, that didn't really happen. That there, but what if it caused immediate consequences as, you know, there are examples globally, um, people being massacred in India, for instance, based on false rumors getting started through uh, WhatsApp that do suggest that this idea of sort of patience because tr truth will emerge in the long run may not work in a world that's so immediate as our own. And that's where I think we really have to think harder again about some of the kind of free speech absolutism, it's sometimes called a kind of position that really just digs in on that kind of old Miltonian ideal. He was really writing for a different world in which books slowly made their way into people's consciousness and ideas would be debated for years. There would, could be no rapid action the way a rumor now can get started in 24 hours something's viral and all the consequences have already happened and you know no one's waiting to see what's the truth. So the, that is the great problem, how to, how to balance those things. Because the problem is that most free speech jurisprudence is about um, advocacy speech. It's not about factual speech and correctness. You can say something wrong in most contexts, except, of course, in commercial contexts. So it isn't really even designed to deal with error. And the other lesson of the moment, of course, is that dissent is important, and you have to be able to protect people arguing it back against the Vietnam War, for instance, or against the Iraq War, or right or left. Um, and how to balance those things, I think, is the great challenge of our time, the need for an open public sphere, but a world in which lies of different kinds and dangerous lies 
circulate seemingly with impunity with real consequences. Oh, yeah. Hi. Thanks uh, for the talk. It was, it was great. Um, so at, at one point you described um, the issue of people arguing over like who has access to the truth or who, get, who gets to have the access. And I wonder, um, on one of you at least, like maybe the problem is that both sides or everybody's assuming that there is some truth out there mm -hmm. to be accessed. Um, it seems to me the project of Dewey uh, and the pragmatists, certainly Rorty, even to some extent Rawls in a way, mm -hmm. is to actually get truth, at least foundational truth, out of the way. Yeah. Um, and not think that we, that anybody has access to like at least like a like a metaphysical thing that like tells us what right. democracy is or what liberalism is, um, and we can care about justif we can care about justification. We can care about certainly uh, the standards of debate. You know, like the Habermas project. Um, but um, truth itself, maybe the problem is at least on this view is that people think there actually is a truth out there, and, and if we get rid of that. Again, a mind, a mind independent truth. You know, we can, and you said forge truth at the end, and I wonder, like that, that's the kind of thing I, I was wondering if, what your thoughts on that were. Yeah, that's a very good point, because I, I do think that there, I mean, you're asking a really interesting question, of course. The, so Rawls avoided the word truth as much as possible. He liked to talk about, I think it's public reason, right? As sort of, instead of saying you arrive at political truth, um, precisely so as to not give that kind of heavy weight, I think, to what comes out of political processes. But there are at least two, whenever I try to think about this, I think it's important that we think about what kind of truth we're talking about. So there are some basic truths, you know, either it is snowing out or it isn't. And I don't think Rawls would have said there's no answer to that question. Some things have co simply correct answers, um, you know, I took the bus to work today, it was the number 40. That's a kind of factual information that more than one piece, person would need to verify before you could be sure I wasn't lying. But there is a correct answer to that. And we need that kind of truth as a starting point, in some ways, for any kind of subsequent discussion. The second harder question, the Rawlsian question, or maybe the Deweyan question, has to do with once we start discussing and we get to anything beyond those basic factual empirical truths that I was talking about earlier, and we get to something more like what I called political truth, is it really truth anymore? Because it's full of interpretations. Even my example of the unemployment statistic has a lot built into it that makes it not as bald-faced a fact as I took the number 40 bus. Uh, and do we call that truth too? Maybe that's a semantic distinction, but maybe in this moment it's a more substantive distinction because I think what's scared people in part is that the disregard for even the basic truths makes it impossible to even have debates about those higher level truths that if you can't even get good information, if you have no, if I don't even know the bus schedule and I don't see any numbers on the buses and nobody tells me what they are, I'm making this up as I go, the, uh, then, then we don't even have a starting point for arriving at a more complex interpretive truth. So even though we might not all agree about something, yeah, I could say something as plain to you as the Civil War was fought about slavery and every historian in the room will, will nod, but that might, for some people in American life, that's a contentious claim. That's a matter of interpretation right there, even though it seems factual. The danger of saying that's not a truth is to say that everything goes all the time. So I think it's not so terrible to sometimes call truths things that we, largely have consensus about, but it doesn't mean that there is no interpretive work going into the statement, no value work, in other words, and that we're all 100% certain that this is the way the world worked. I think what you can say is that our general consensus now among most people is that the Civil War was fought over slavery, but that is a statement that's up to challenge and revision, the same way any historical claim is, and that's the sort of beauty of public life is that we have the power to constantly probe again, even something that seems, to my mind, a settled fact. So I don't know if that solves the problem at all, but that's, that's at least where I'm thinking. Oh, 
Oh dear. Well, I um, if if people have questions and things they want to talk about, I'm sorry we've run out of time. I'm happy to stick around. I don't have to be anywhere immediately. You might have to, but I don't. So if you want to discuss anything else, um, please come up. But thank you very much for your patience and your interesting questions.